Anybody love Jesus in the room? Come on, you sound like you're still waking up. I need all the people that are excited about the goodness of God to make some noise. Come on, where would we be without this Jesus? He, he saved us. He delivered us. He turned our lives around. We have, we have so much, so much to be grateful for. I'm excited to, to preach to you today, and if I'm being honest, I'm, I feel like preaching. I don't want to just talk to you. I, I feel like encouraging you and stirring up your faith because here's what, here's what I love. I love that we're in a series on the miracles of Jesus, talking about his goodness, what he's done. I'm really believing that not only is your faith going to be stirred, but I'm believing that we're going to see miracles happen in your life. Is there anybody in the room that would say, man, I could use a miracle. I could use a touch from heaven. Come on, I need somebody with a little bit of faith to make some noise in the room. I could, I could use all the blessings. I could use all the miracles. It's amazing. It's exciting. How many of you love your pastors? Come on, I just… I love, I love Pastor Jeremy and Jen. I love that they're, it would be on their heart that this would be our focus because I'll tell you what, there are plenty of churches that aren't talking about miracles. There are plenty of churches that, that say stay away from that, but I, I love a church that's willing to put their faith in front of them and, and expect God to do what no one else can. If we've not met before, my name is Chris, and I come all the way from New York City, and I get to serve on the team here as somebody that gets to contribute to the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. Uh, along with that, I get to serve the Brooklyn Nets as the chaplain, along with leading something called Soho Bible Study, which happens once a month. And what we're seeing God do there is pretty miraculous and, and amazing. The better part of me is that I'm married to the greatest woman in the world, and her name is Jairus. We'll be celebrating 19 years of marriage this November. And we have two beautiful children, Dylan and Chloe, and tomorrow we're all going on a ministry trip together, which does not get to happen often or really ever, um, and I think that's because we're going to Hawaii. So I'm, um, I'm going to preach, and the whole family said, we're coming with you, and I'm like, oh, how sweet that you want to come do the work of the Lord. <laughs> in Hawaii. And, uh, but no, I'm, I'm excited for it. I'm excited for it. Hey, if you have your Bibles, uh, open up with me to the book of John. And if you don't have your Bibles, that's okay. We're going to throw the scripture up on the screen. But I do want to encourage you to do your best to take notes. Uh, I think it's appropriate that anytime the Word of God is opened up and the Word of God is preached, that you make yourself available to write down what you're hearing. Because how often do we tell ourselves we'll remember something and then we forget about it. And I, I really believe that the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you through this message. John chapter 9, starting at verse 1, it reads this way. It says, while he was passing by, he is Jesus, he noticed the man who had been blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, which means teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed and illustrated in him. Man, how powerful is that? It was so that the works of God might be displayed and illustrated in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world, giving guidance through my word and my works. Giving guidance through my word and my works. I love that this is a church that doesn't just hold on to the word and ignores the works. Because, you know, there are some churches that only focus on the word and they don't pay attention to the works. And then there are other churches that only focus on the works but pay no attention to the word. They just get up there and say whatever that rhymes. I love that this is a church that's about the word and the works. It says, when he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with his saliva, and he spread the mud like an ointment on the man's eyes. He said to him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated to scent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. So the neighbors and those who used to know him as a beggar said, is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Still others said, nah, but he looks like him. But he kept saying, I'm the man. In other words, no, 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 it's, it's me. That was, that was me. In fact, this is the man that, that would say, I once was blind, but, but now I see. This is what he's saying. I'm the man. 
So they said to him, how were your eyes open? And he replied, the man called Jesus made mud and smeared it on my eyes and told me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. I want to take the next few moments and I want to talk to you from this thought. I've seen it with my own eyes. If you're taking notes, go ahead and write that down. I've seen it with my own eyes. Let's pray one more time. Holy Spirit, speak. Have your way. Heal. Do what only you could do. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, we live in a day, an age, where people want to deconstruct our faith. And to be honest, I'm not mad at this idea of deconstruction as long as it leads to reconstruction. Like, let's get rid of false theology, ideologies, philosophies that do not match up with the Word of God. I'm, I'm all about accountability. Accountability is necessary. And if there's anything in me that isn't taking me forward as a believer and us as a body, then I don't want it. Let's get rid of whatever is not God. Fair? But with that said, in an attempt... In an attempt to filter right belief from wrong belief, I've noticed something that's happening in the church world, and it's terribly wrong. And maybe you've noticed it as well. There are deconstructionists that have been making a great mistake, and, and maybe you've seen their videos on social media, maybe you watched a video on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, or maybe you had a conversation with them in the lobby, or, or you spoke to them at a, at a, at a coffee shop, but, but now they think they know better. They, they think they know better because for whatever reason, they stopped believing fully what they once believed. Let me be very clear, over the next few moments, I'm not I'm not going to point out the non-believer. The non-believer doesn't know any better. And I mean that respectfully. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 through 15, it tells us that those that don't have the Spirit cannot understand the things of the Spirit. So my issue today is not with the non-believer. My issue today is with the Christian that identifies as a believer, but that is trying to deconstruct the miraculous work and power of God. They have an issue with it simply because they cannot explain it. They believe that if we can't explain it, then we shouldn't believe it. And if I'm being honest, I could not disagree more. In fact, I'd like to go on record stating not everything we believe in can be fully explained. Not everything we've seen can be fully explained. Not everything we've experienced can be fully explained. But because I've seen it, I believe it. Let me break it down. The essence of our Christianity is faith, hope, and love. And what accompanies faith, hope, and love are miracles, signs, and wonders. Faith is essential for these three to take place. According to Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Perhaps no other component of the Christian life is more important than faith. We cannot purchase it, we cannot sell it, and we cannot give it to our friends, nor can we fully explain it with logic, reasoning, or science. In fact, the dictionary defines faith as belief in, devotion to, or trust in somebody or something, especially without logical proof. It also defines faith as belief in and devotion to God. My friends, the Bible has much to say about faith and how important it is. In fact, it is so important that without faith, we have, no, we have no place with God and it is impossible to please him, as noted in Hebrews 11.6. So according to the Bible, faith is belief in the one true God without actually seeing him. And yet, in my life, although I've never seen God, I've seen God. Let me say it this way. Although I've never seen his face, I've seen the results of his stare. Although I've never seen his physical hand, I have seen the results of his powerful hand. Although I've never made eye contact with him, I am certain for a fact that he has been looking after me. I believe it because I've seen it. I, I believe it because I've seen it in moments where things were going a certain direction and it made no sense. God intervened. In moments when the doctors said to give up, God intervened. In a moment where, where there was relational issues, where there was emotional issues, where there was depression, where there was frustration, 
frustration, something happened and there was a shift. And although I cannot show you tangible evidence of what happened, I could show you the evidence in me that I'm not who I used to be because of what I've seen God do in my own life. And maybe I'm the only one. And if I'm the only one, I'll worship him by myself. But if there is anybody in the room that can identify with me and say, no, no, Chris, my testimony is the same as yours. I've seen God show up in my life. I've seen him move in my marriage. I've seen him move in my mental health. I've seen him move in my health. I've seen him move in my family. I've seen him show up when I thought I was by myself and I was not going to make it, but I am only here because of what God did. I believe it because for myself, I've seen it. If there are any of those people in the room, take about 10 seconds and give Jesus your best shout of praise. I think it is imperative that we would celebrate off of the memory of what it is that God has done for us. And we don't have to wait for a moment. We don't have to wait for a break in the meeting. We don't have to wait for the song. By the mere fact that I once was blind, but now I see. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was deaf, but now I can hear. I once was dead, but now I'm alive. That is enough to give Jesus and Jesus alone all praise, all glory, and all honor at all times. Come on. If you don't mind giving him a shout in the middle of the sermon, go on ahead. A few months ago, I was out at dinner with some friends, and we were having this, this talk, this conversation about how much we love Jesus and how there are people in our world that we try to express this love that we have for Jesus and, and why we go to church and, and why this relationship means so much to us. And then one of my friends said, I'm, I'm tired of explaining it. I just, I wish I could, I wish I could show them. And that's it. That is vital. That is important because, friends, let me tell you, there is something that experience does that explanation cannot do. There is something that experience does that explanation cannot do. This is why if you're talking to someone about God and they say, well, explain more, just say, come with me to church. So, hey, I'll pick you up. I'll buy you a coffee. If you hate it, we can leave in the middle of the service, but just come with me to church because all you got to do is get them in the presence of God because the moment you get in the presence of God, everything shifts. And friends, that's exactly how it works. In fact, that's how it's supposed to work. For all of you note takers, write down Acts 3.16. It says, by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him as you all can see. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 21. He is the one. He is the one you praise. He is your God who performed for you those great and awesome wonders you saw with your own eyes. What I'm trying to say to you is that it's set up this way. We believe it because we've seen it. We believe it because we've experienced it. We, we believe it because we've, we've noticed it. Which is important then that if we're going to deconstruct anything, I want to deconstruct this idea that everything God does must be explained with reasoning. As if. As if God ever needed to give any one of us a reason to do what he does. God does not need my permission to be God. He is God all by himself. And because he's God, he'll do God things. He moves like he wants. He talks like he wants. He responds how he wants to respond. He is God. He will bless who he wants to bless. He will provide for who he wants to provide for. He will heal who he wants to heal. He will love who he wants to love. He will save who he wants to save. And because you know that he has shown up in your own life, child of God, believer, born again, Christian, I want to encourage you to stand both on your theology and your experience. I'm saying this respectfully to encourage us as a body while pulling those operating under a superior pretense off of their false spiritual high horse. In other words, I want to correct those that think they know better. Let me remind you of Romans 11:34. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. In other words, 
You can't fully explain why God does what he does. And yet, everybody wants to challenge us on why we believe in what we cannot explain. But you know what response I have become completely comfortable with? This is a response I want to submit to you, and I want you to start applying to your own life. This is probably the most the, the, theological, accurate response you could give to somebody when they ask you something that you're unsure about. You ready? I don't know. Well, why would he do that? I don't know. Well, why would he save them? I don't know. And here's the thing. I don't know what I don't know. But here's what I do know. He's God and he could do what he wants. Yeah, but, but explain to me why he would heal that body. I'm not sure, but he did. Well, why would he, why would he make a way for them when there, when there wasn't any way? And, and how about all the other people? I'm not really sure, but I do know what he did for them. And I am not going to diminish what he did in his own sovereignty and in his own reasoning and in his own mindset simply because you were trying to compare it to something else. I'm not sure why he blessed them and why he didn't bless you but I am certain that he did bless them I don't know why he didn't do it for you but I do know that he did it for them well well when is he gonna do it for me I don't know well when is he gonna provide for me I don't know when is he gonna give me the raise I, I maybe you're a bad worker but I don't know I don't know what I don't know, but what I do know is that he is God and he is good. And here's what I know. He still heals. He still provides. He is the one that sticks closer than a brother. He is the one that is there for the brokenhearted. He is the one that is able to provide peace that surpasses all understanding. I have seen him move. I am seeing him do great things. I can't tell you why he does what he does, but I do know that he does it. I can't tell you why he would take a, a handful of uneducated disciples and allow them to be those that turn the world upside down. I don't know, but I do know that because he worked through them, their impact on the world is great. I, I can't tell you why he would talk to a woman midday at a well, a woman that was operating in adultery and infidelity, but I do know that he met her where she was at and he turned her life around. And as a result of it, she became a missionary going to her people telling them, come meet a man that told me everything about me. I don't know why a woman can push through a crowd and touch the hem of his garment, but I do know that that woman that did push and got a hold of him did find the healing that she was looking for. I also learned through that woman that even in your weakest moment, you are strong enough to get to Jesus. I don't know why he does what he does. I just know he does it. And I'm okay with that. Because he is God, and I am not. And I can tell you that whatever he does is good. Friends, I've seen his goodness. I've seen his goodness in good people's life. I've, I've seen the faithful be richly blessed. I've seen, I've seen him walk with people that were walking with him. I've seen him show up for people that did not want him. I've seen him bless good people, and I've seen him bless not so good people. I've seen him take care of saved people, and I've seen him take care of non-saved people. And there are people that are bothered by that. But if you're bothered by that, then you should pay attention to this story, because maybe what you're looking for, you're missing. And what's there is what you need to lean in on. The Bible says that as Jesus was walking by, he noticed a man. John 9, 1, as Jesus was passing by, he noticed a man who had been blind from birth. The same way that God noticed that man, let me encourage you, God notices you. He sees you where you're at. He sees what you're dealing with. So if you're praying prayers that aren't getting answered, do not ask yourself the question, does he see me? He sees you. My, my encouragement to you would celebrate the fact that he sees you. And because you are in his sight and you are in his care, he is going to take care of you. It just may not happen on your timeline. I love the fact that we serve a God that notices. I love that we serve a God that notices those that can't even notice him. Ooh. 
This was a man that could not see, and yet that did not matter. That did not change anything. In fact, if you read the text, the man that could not see doesn't even ask of Jesus. Jesus notices the man and then gives him a command and tells him and tells him what to do. This is the kind of God that we serve. He is so good, and he says, I will take care of you. I will meet you. I will love on you, and I will heal you in moments where you're not even expecting of it. Well, what did this man do to deserve it? Nothing. Write this down. Every miracle you ever see is given, not earned. Every miracle you have ever seen is given freely and not earned. I will use this scripture just to make my point. John 9 verse 2 says his disciples asked him, Rabbi, teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? What? Who sinned? We got to be careful, man, because there's so many of us that operate in this mindset of accomplishing and achieving, and we start viewing God the way that we view our children or the way that our parents viewed us or the way that this world treats us. If you do well, you get to advance. If you accomplish more, you'll be able to get more. But according to the word of God, he doesn't operate like that because Romans 3.10 says, there is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says, my righteousness is but filthy rags, which tells me that even on my best day, I'm still not good enough to get to God, but because of his grace, he allows it. Who, who sinned? This, this man or his parents? This is the day and age we live in, by the way. People ask questions like that all the time, and because it's kind of confusing, we think they're right. Like, oh, that sounds like a smart question. What a dumb question. Who sinned? This man who was born blind? Did this man sin? Is that why he was born blind? Tell me, sir, when did he have time to sin if he was born blind? Did he sin in the womb? Did he say something or think a thought inside of his mother's belly and Jesus said, I gotcha. What could be possibly happening? And this is where my prayer is for each and every one of us that we would never lose the revelation of the grace of God because when I have a revelation of the grace of God, I never think I'm better than anyone else. I realize, I realize that I'm a sinner lost just like you and you look just like me, but because of Jesus, we get to be here. Oh, I wish, I wish not to say that I have a better, a better way of thinking than Jesus, but man, I wish that when the disciples asked who sinned, Jesus said, all oh, y'all. You sin, do you? You sin all the time. You, you make mistakes all the time. And he says, but neither this man or his parents sinned, but it was for my sake. It was for my benefit. It was, it was so that I could showcase my glory on his life, which speaks to something different. It, it tells me that what I'm going through is not necessarily my mistake, but it's simply a part of God's plan. Because God wants to showcase his glory in the brokenness and the imperfections and the, and the imperfections of his people. So when you start asking God, why am I dealing with what I'm dealing with? What did I do? The Holy Spirit saying, son, daughter, quiet your spirit. You didn't do anything wrong. Hear me. You're not perfect, but it's not because you did something wrong. Let me say it this way. You're not a problem. You're a prop. Your life will point to the goodness of God. Because when God shows up, what happens is you get to, like this man gets to say, that was me. I once was blind, but now I see. He is looking for people that his glory could fall upon. Here's another way of saying it. Your story, his glory. He is looking for people that would say, that was me. I once was broken. I once was lost. I once was confused. My marriage was on the rocks. I did fail. I did commit infidelity. I was dealing with addiction. I was angry. I was broken. I was depressed. But then Jesus met me. And because Jesus met me, I'm not who I used to be. And the moment you start getting vocal about what Jesus 
did for you, other people start believing that if he did it for you, he could do it for them. And they say, tell me more about this Jesus. And you say, oh, he's so good that even when I wasn't saved, even when I wasn't serving God, he still met me. Let that mess with your theology. The man's not even saved yet. Go read the whole story. He gets saved later. He gets healed. Jesus leaves. He stands before the Pharisees, and they say, who, who healed you? What, what happened to you? And at first, the Pharisees ask the parents, but the parents say nothing because they're scared of being arrested. Those, those punks, they abandon their child, but the child, too, is so full of confidence because of what Jesus did for him. He said, Jesus healed me. I'm the man. And then they go away, and then the Bible says that the man went and found Jesus, and, and then he and then and Jesus, Jesus became his savior. He wasn't even saved yet. And so many of you will say, well, unless you get your life right, God won't do it. How do you know? Just welcome that man and say, let me pray with you. Let me, let me stand with you. I can't fully understand what you're dealing with, but I'll hold your hand and I'll cry with you and I'll try to offer some advice. I don't know why you're dealing with what you're dealing with, but I do know whatever you are dealing with, God can handle. I'll never forget, it's 2011, August. I was home with my son, Dylan. He was in my arms, and we fell asleep. And we woke up to the sound of my wife crying. Because she looked at Dylan and saw that he had these bruises all over his body. Her scream woke me up, and then I noticed these, these bruises that weren't there just a few seconds ago. So we rush Dylan to the hospital. Right away, the doctors start to perform some tests, and they let us know that Dylan has a blood condition, and his blood platelets are significantly low. In fact, the condition is called ITP. And they let us know that Dylan's blood platelets are drastically low. See, the average healthy human's blood platelet count is at 250,000 to 350,000. But in that moment, Dylan's blood platelet count was at 18,000. They said, we're going to run some tests. We're going to try some things. He should be fine by the morning. Morning comes. His blood platelets are now at 11,000. They say, you know, we're going to try some other things. We'll see what, see what happens. Next day comes, 8,000. Later that day, it drops to 5,000. Now the tone in their voice changed. Now they're saying there's this potential that he has leukemia. We're going to have to schedule a spinal tap. There's a possibility that we're going to have to remove his spleen. Can you put that picture up of my son? I remember looking at him going, God, what? Come on, man. It's my baby boy. Why would this happen? He's innocent. He's done nothing. I go in the hallway, and a friend calls me. And to be honest, I didn't want to speak to anybody at the moment. I knew what he was going to say. He was going to try to encourage me. And I didn't feel like being encouraged in that moment. Pick up the phone with every intent of hanging up quick. But he was a quicker talker than me. He said, Chris, I'm here with Pastor Jude. Pastor Jude wants to tell you something. Pastor Jude gets on the phone. He says, Chris, I want you to know that I'm praying and believing for Dylan. In fact, just a few months ago, I was with another pastor, and his son went through the same thing. I prayed over his son, and then his son was healed. He said, here's what's about to happen. Woo! He said, here's what's about to happen. I'm about to pray over Dylan, and he will be healed by 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. We prayed, we cried, only to wake up to the sound of the doctors and the nurses the next day celebrating. His blood platelets went up overnight. It didn't make any sense. It rose up. Not only that, there was no trace of the ITP. A couple days later, I called Pastor Jude to thank him. And I said, Pastor Jude, thank you for praying. But can you just answer a question for me? Why did you tell me that other person's story before praying for Dylan? And he said, because, Chris, the presence of God abides on the Ark of the Testimony. The presence of God abides on the Ark of the Testimony, which makes sense. Why? Because we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So the presence of God abides on the Ark of the Testimony. Well, fast forward just a few months ago. One of my dearest friends, Al, who travels with me every week, this weekend he's on vacation. But his wife, Wanda, who's one of our dearest friends, called me and she said, Pastor, I want you to pray with my boss. I get on the phone with her boss 
And I say, tell me what's going on. And he says, well, I need you to pray for my son. He has RSV. He's developed a blood clots and has low oxygen and he had to be intubated. This man was completely discouraged. Let me also point out, he wasn't a Christian. I said, I want to pray for you and I want to pray for your son's healing. But before I pray for you, can I tell you about my son? I told him Dylan's story. He was encouraged. We prayed. Would you know a week later, that baby boy was completely healed and out of the hospital? Here's what I'm saying. What God did before, he could do it again. And I only shared these stories in hope that the Holy Spirit could fall on your story and you would believe that the same way God opens blind eyes, the same way he hears rare blood disease, diseases, the same way he can touch, he can touch voices and babies and lungs, he could meet you where you're at. He could do it for your marriage. He could do it for your mental health. He could do it for your addiction. He could do it for your brokenness. I know you're dealing with things that you don't want to talk about. I know there's there's habits that you have that you're embarrassed to share, but God goes, son, I see you. Daughter, I see you, and it's not too big for me. I will meet you where you're at. I will touch you where you're at. I will heal you. I will release you. You don't need to live like this. I know you can do it, Lord. So here's what I'm saying. If you're in the room and you need a miracle, lift up your hand. You need a miracle, lift up your hand. You're in the perfect place. Stand on your feet. Come on, stand on your feet. Prayer team, I need you to run down here. Prayer team, come line up in the front. We're going to pray with you. We're going to stand with you. We're going to believe that God is going to meet you. We're going to believe that Jesus is going to touch you. We're going to believe that the Holy Spirit is going to fall on you. So if you lifted up your hands, step out of your seat, come down to the front, and we're going to pray God's favor over you. We're going to God. We're going to pray God's healing power over you. We're going to declare freedom over you. If you're married, come with your spouse. If you're a parent, come with your child. But come and let's believe that God is going to meet us where we're at. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are the way, waymaker. Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yes, you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. See, you are here, you are here, moving in on. Working in this place, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, you're working in.
would you stand and sing with us? So we sing in faith. That is who you are. 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 Oh, he's always working, we know. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. You know what's a miracle for some of the people in this room? That somebody else would stand with them. Some of us take for granted the people we get to do life with. There are some people that are operating in isolation. And it would mean so much if someone they'd never met would attach their faith to their situation. If you're willing to be a brother and a sister that stands and believes for someone that you don't know, would you stretch out your hands and, and just stretch it towards the front? Come on, city first. I just dare you right now to start praying, start asking that God would touch your brothers and your sisters. You don't need to know every detail. You don't need to know what's going on. You just need to know that God is aware and that his power can meet their needs. Come on, with your hands stretched out. Father God, we come before you right now and we stand on behalf of our brothers and our sisters. We say we don't know the details, but we do know that you're aware of all of it and all of it you can handle nothing is too difficult for you nothing is too hard for you if they're dealing with sickness heal their bodies if they're dealing with emotional trauma heal their bodies if they need peace oh father God give them peace if they're mourning oh God weep with them and be with them and comfort them if they're in need of a job if they're in need of finances if they're in need of clarity if they're in need of restoration if they need a child to come home if they need a spouse to come home if they need a mortgage to be paid for Holy Spirit, we are inviting all of you into every space and every place and say, do what only you could do because it is better in your hands than it is on our own. On our own, oh God, we can only make it but so far. But you're the one that can make a way where there seems to be no way. You are the way maker. You are the chain breaker. You are the family restorer. You are the blind eye opener. You are the ear, the ear healing, the heart turning, the eye opening the God that loves and cares for all of his people young and old those that know him and those that don't know him yet so we release all this into your hand and say have your way church if you agree with that and believe that can you shout amen Man, amen. So amazing, Pastor Chris's message. So encouraging. You know, it meets us right where we're at. Many of us are praying and believing for miracles. And if that's you today, man, we're praying for you and believe that God's going to work in your life. And man, we'd love to be a part of that journey as your church family. Let us know if you have a prayer request um, or if you have a praise report, man. If God's answered your prayer and done a miracle in your life, we want to hear about it. Jump on the website and share your story. And maybe you're tuning in today and, and you're peeking into the window of church in a sense, and you've never heard about who Jesus is and the plan that he has for you and the grace that he has for you. And I want to give you an opportunity today to make a decision to begin a relationship with Jesus. You know, the reality is we're all separated from God because of sin. That's what the Bible calls it, basically just missing the mark. But thankfully, because of Jesus, we can have a relationship with our Heavenly Father and experience the life that we are intended to have. And in Romans, it talks about all we have to do to experience that life is to simply acknowledge who God is and to receive his grace. And if you'd like to do that today, I'd like to just lead you in a very simple prayer. And if you'd like to begin in that relationship with Jesus, pray this prayer after me. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die for me. I accept your grace and choose to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, if you prayed that prayer, that is the best decision that you could ever make in beginning the most important relationship that you have in your life. And we have a few next steps for you. The first one is you gotta tell somebody that you made that decision. And the second one is, man, keep coming back, keep showing up, be a part of City First. And then the third one is we have this thing called the New Beginnings Resource, and you can access it through uh, our app or our website. It's entirely free, but basically what it is, is it's just explaining a little bit further about that decision that you're making today. And then after you go through the new beginning resource, we have something called Growth Track. And I love Growth Track because it allows you to discover the God-given purpose and gifts that he's placed inside of you. It gets you connected to City First to find community. Um, and it just helps you grow in your faith. And so you can do that online. Um, it's really easy. It starts the first Sunday of every month. So you go to cityfirst.church forward slash growth track. Um, but we'd love for you to be a part of that as well as a next step. That's right. We're praying for you. Come back next week for th week three of Supernatural, the miracles of Jesus. It's going to be amazing. And make sure you invite someone to join with you. So hope you have a great week. We're praying we'll for you, you, church. Week. We'll see you Sunday.